because obviously there must be something more to it than that. Because how can you get soldiers to get up early in the morning? How can you get soldiers to train so hard? How can you get soldiers to charge into battle knowing that they might be wounded? Actually, they will be wounded and many of them will be killed. How can you get them to do that? Motivation. That general was brilliant at motivating his troops to see the benefits in actually getting up early in the morning. Actually to have like the, the feeling of um, pride, if you like, to be strong, to be a good soldier, to have the patriotism, to serve your country, to sacrifice yourself for a bigger cause, whatever it was. He was such a great motivator, they never needed to force his soldiers. They couldn't wait to get up in the morning. They couldn't wait to train. They were just waiting, wanting to get into battle. That's why when he gave them the orders, they were only doing what they really wanted to do. So, how you have discipline, whatever you tell yourself to do, want to do it. Motivate yourself. So those of you on retreat, you're getting up five o'clock tomorrow morning, want to get up in the morning. Think to yourself, one extra hour means, look, if, if you take one hour off your sleep every night, then that makes, if you say average eight hours of sleep, and they go down to seven hours of sleep, that's actually one twenty-fourth of your life extended. In 72 years, say, that's an extra three years on your life. And instead of adding on the end of your life, when it's pretty useless because you're so old you can't enjoy it anyway, you add that time and this part of your life. So one extra, one hour of your sleep is three extra years of life. Isn't that wonderful? So motivate yourself to get up early in the morning. You can catch up on your sleep when you're dead in your coffin. And, in, and this is a time you get enlightened. Isn't this wonderful? This is not like just getting up to go to work. This is getting up to stop all the work. And if you don't get up early tomorrow morning and get enlightened in this retreat, you're going to have to come back to life again and work and work and work for many, many lifetimes. So if you do it properly, get up early this morning, next morning, that can be the end of getting up forever. <laughs> get enlightened so you can see you motivate yourself and you've got to sit meditation how can I motivate myself to watch the breath the Buddha became enlightened watching the breath that was his method this is important if you watch the breath who knows just like the Buddha it could be your time Oh, I must get to my breath pretty quickly. This might be my day. Who knows? So you really want to watch the breath. You had, especially for those of you who have had any good meditation experiences, you have so much fun with your breath. It's like meeting an old friend. If I meet an old friend, I've had really a great time with them before, I forget what I'm supposed to do and I go and have a cup of coffee with them. It's like, it's nice hanging out with your old friends. It's like my breath is my old friend. I've had such a wonderful time with my old friend, the breath. So I hang out with it. How are you going, breath? We had a wonderful jhana the last time we met. Yeah, remember that one? Oh, that was a great one. Let's do it again. <laughs> so that it becomes natural. You don't need to discipline the mind because it's fun. When I was a school teacher, I was taught this in educational psychology. If you make your lesson fun, the children want to listen. If you make it fun, they want to do the task. If you make it boring, then of course no one wants to do it. If it's not fun, if it's not enjoyable, then the discipline is shot. That's why if you're trying to discipline your mind in meditation, you're not having fun, you're wasting your time. Make it fun in your meditation. 
That's why I said, do the breathing backwards. <laughs> Make it fun. I'm the only one who teaches breath meditation backwards. For those of you who haven't heard that before, you breathe out first and then you breathe in. <laughs> it's breathing backwards because most people breathe in first and then they breathe out. Or sit in a different position. All of you sitting this way, sit the other way, face backwards. <laughs> Make it fun, enjoy yourself. See what happens next. <laughs> so, don't be a creature of habit, always doing things the same old way, that you die that way. The same with your relationships. You've been married a long time, you've got to be innovative. Do things differently. Even if it's sleep on the opposite side of the bed, instead of husband on this side, wife on that side, swap. Anything for a bit of innovation. Even, this is one of my ways of uh, waking up early in the morning. When you get up early in the morning, you brush your teeth, what side of the mouth do you start on? The left or the right, upper gum or lower gum? Live on the wild side. Start on the opposite side of the mouth tomorrow morning. <laughs> what you're doing there is because you're doing it different, you're not a creature of habit, you do it the other side, you're more awake. When you go to work in the morning, don't always go on the same route. Go on a different route. It's amazing what you might find. Go, okay, you may be late, but you have more fun. <laughs> so, don't be a creature of habit. And then, life becomes fun, it becomes interesting, and then you don't need discipline anymore. You do it because you want to. Because life is fun. You enjoy doing it. You enjoy being a wife. You enjoy being a husband. You enjoy being a monk. You enjoy going to work. You may, even when you're sick, you enjoy being sick. I enjoy going to the dentist. I do. Because those dentist chairs, we haven't got any chairs like that in my monastery. It's the most comfortable chair. I lay back. And the best thing about going to the dentist, they put all this stuff in the mouth. For once, no one can ask me a question. <laughs> it's the only peace I get going to the dentist. <laughs> so you look at the positive side. And that's where you get all the discipline you ever want. Fun. So make it that you want to do what you tell yourself to do. If you've got people working in your office to get good discipline, motivate them to want to do the task. And then they'll always do it. Don't try fear. Fear never works. Joy always works. Any other question? Yep, over there. Yes? Yep. Correct. Yep. Okay, you're talking about the role of mindfulness in the first jhana. The first jhana is a powerful state. It's not just the five hindrances have gone. But it's also the five senses have gone as well. You're just left with the mind. The body's disappeared. In the first jhana, you can't hear anything. You can't feel your body. If someone kicks you, you would not know it. It's happened many times. This is another story about one of, um, one of the disciples. He had terrible migraines when he was a young man. And he was actually in the British Army at this time. He, I think, was a warrant officer. So he's in charge of a group of soldiers. They were on manoeuvres in Germany, in West Germany. The order came through on the radio to stop and have a rest. At this particular time he had a terrible migraine, so he told his second in command, you look after the soldiers. He saw a barn, so I'm going to sit in that barn because it's dark and just try and get rid of my migraine. Because if you have migraines, in the dark places you feel much more comfortable. But how he dealt with his migraine was actually going deep inside the pain as I was telling you before and he could do it he went so deep inside the pain he couldn't feel any pain at all he didn't realize at the time but he was going into a jhana 
Because what happened at this particular time, he said he can't do it now, but he used to do it when he was young. What happened next was the order came through the radio that the um, orders had been changed, pack up your things, start moving, they've got to go somewhere else. So all the soldiers packed up their stuff, got into their truck and were you know, a mile down the road when they realised they'd left this guy in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the shed. So they went back and he was sitting in the shed, absolutely immobile, and they just lifted him up and dumped him in the truck. And they'd seen him do this before. Now soldiers aren't the most gentle of people, but he hadn't got any knowledge at all that they were lifting him up and dumping in a truck. When he came out of his meditation, he said, just going inwards. He came out, he went you know, into this state in a barn, he came out in a truck. And he wondered, how the heck did I get in here? And the soldiers explained to him, all that time he couldn't feel a thing. He was perfectly aware, but deep inside, not outside. That's actually what happens with Ajahn. What the mindfulness is, is the mindfulness starts to get powerful and focused. We can have mindfulness about all sorts of things. It's both wide and moving very fast. Mindful of this, then mindful of that, then mindful of something else. Because it's always moving, it doesn't build up power. When it's still, you tend to see more things. What you see, as I was saying this the other day, it's like the, a photograph developing. Just when you first develop a photograph, the negative, whatever it is, the colours, first of all, are very dim and then they sort of come out more and more as the colours actually start to manifest on the photographic paper. That's how it works. And that's what mindfulness is like. If you're very still, the information starts to become richer and deeper and all the detail starts to happen. If you're moving, you just get a blur on the photograph. So when mindfulness becomes still, it becomes powerful and it goes inside, inside the center of things. So what happens when you are given up the five hindrances? The mindfulness is still. It doesn't desire anything, it doesn't uh, want anything, it's got no ill will, it's neither rejecting nor accepting it's got no sloth and torpor, it's bright, it's not restless, it's not moving backwards and forwards and it's certain of what's happening. What happens if those five hindrances are overcome? That mindfulness solidifies and goes in, in, in. It goes into time, into the present moment, it goes into the silence, it goes into the body, it goes into the mind. And it goes that far in that mindfulness becomes superpowered mindfulness. If you know the mindfulness within a jhana, it's incredibly powerful, but still. Those five factors of jhana, I'll tell this later on, it's another talk later on about the jhanas. It's one factor of jhana, but just with five aspects. What's actually happening there, the one-pointedness, Everything is in one place. The other aspect, the Vitaka Vichara, is a wobble in the experience. The Piti Sukha is completely together. That is the object. That's what you're experiencing in the jhana. That's what you're mindful of. The mindfulness is of bliss. You're not mindful of the body. You're not mindful of sounds. You're not mindful of the breath. That's all been passed a long time ago. When you come out of those states, you say, what are you experiencing? There's only one word, bliss, ecstasy. That's the object. That's why it's the, it's the samadhi japiti sukha, the happiness born of samadhi. Is that a question? Okay. Okay, yeah, I've got a, a thing here. The audience upstairs. Hi, upstairs. I'm, I'm waving, I've got a television there. If you have a question, you, if you can actually ask a question. Any questions upstairs? No. Can't get one question here. You're pointing at something. I can see you. Can you see me? Can you, I'm waving at you. Can you wave back? 
Yeah, thanks. <laughs> nice to be out there. You've got a question? You can come to the microphone for a question. No? Okay, no one's coming. Is there a question up there? No. Okay, a question from here then, downstairs. Yes. Oh, so did that answer your question about the jhanas? Okay, yes. Your question. Yes, that's me. Yeah, thank you. Is that the question? <laughs> okay, very good. I don't wear a dress. <laughs> yeah. Correct. <laughs> yeah. If you've got a very, very difficult boss, you should um, tell him to come and listen to one of Ajahn Brahm's lectures. <laughs> that actually happened. There was this one of the people who comes to my centre. He was again one of these Waisak Buddhists. He was a Sri Lankan man. He'd only come to the temple on Waisak. The rest of the time you wouldn't see him at all. He's like a Waisak Buddhist. It's just like a, a Christmas Christian who only goes to church on Christmas Day and the rest of the year <laughs> doesn't go at all. So this was a Waisak Buddhist and he was working for the Department, Department of Minerals and Energy in Western Australia. And he had a boss. He told me the story later. He had this boss he called like the boss from hell. But just like that boss, are always giving you so much work, being really demanding, being very, very obnoxious and even though he worked very hard to try and complete the projects if he did complete the projects on time the boss would think okay I can give him more to do and whenever um, he met the boss the boss was always angry demanding a terrible person to work with but it happened that the boss changed in the space of six months the boss changed from being a boss from hell to being a boss from heaven, being so kind, uh, understanding, not so demanding. And actually he said he could work even more and complete more for such a boss when he wasn't getting so upset. But he couldn't help but ask this Australian man, his boss, you've changed, he said, six months ago, if you don't mind me saying, which is so awful working for you, but now... You're so kind. You're so understanding. What's changed you? And the boss, this Australian man, said, I've found this wonderful Buddhist center in Perth. And I've been listening to Ajahn Brahm and had all these wonderful talks. And this Sri Lankan man said, that's my temple. <laughs> but he'd only go there once a year. And now he comes there every week. When he saw the result of the boss from hell, how good attitudes, kindness, letting go, actually encourages more work. You get more from your, your workers when you're kind, encouraging. I've got a little article on the wall which was uh, from the UK Engineering Review where they're giving prizes for innovation in engineering companies. And the company which won the award was a company which banned overtime in the company. They made it sort of company policy, you can only work 45 hours and it's company policy, absolutely, 100%, you can't work more than that. That company, before they initiated that policy, had a huge turnover of staff. People were burning out, getting so upset they were leaving. The customer um, what satisfaction was very, very low. Once they stopped overtime, their staff wanted to stay. Their experience was to the company's advantage. They actually worked harder. They cared for the company because the company cared for them. 
their profits doubled.